everyone. Welcome to the first Green Hope Foundation webinar of 2021. Today, we are going to address the very important question, are we ready for 2021? A very good morning, afternoon, and evening to our amazing panelists and our global audience on Zoom and Facebook Live. My name is Kehkesha. I'm the founder president of Green Hope Foundation, and I will be your moderator for this webinar. My colleague, Pragna, is handling our social media today and will be live tweeting this event. So this new year, 2021, is the one that everyone hopes will be the proverbial dawn of the new normal. And the changes augur well, a new administration in the White House has set the tone by putting environment at the forefront of uh, policy making. Uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons came into effect a week ago, culminating 75 years of work to make illegal one of the greatest threats to humankind. Uh, vaccine rollouts have begun in earnest, but amongst all of these positives, there exist dark clouds of uncertainty over the new virus strains, uh, over new travel restrictions, gloomy jobs data, and the tremendous economic fallout that has really pushed every LDC to near penury. And the misery caused by the virus has pushed into the background the continued conflict in the Middle East. The miserable plight of the Rohingyas no longer makes the news. The forest fires in Borneo continue to burn while CO2 emissions are now in many places back to pre-pandemic. So that brings us to the theme of our discussion today. What should the roadmap for change be? Are we ready? If not, what needs to be addressed and by whom? And in a situation like today's, there will be more questions than answers. And thus, it is our absolute privilege to have with us an eminent panel of multidisciplinary experts who will share their immense knowledge and experience in addressing some of these critical issues that will really shape our uh, days ahead. So without any further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, the Right Honorable Kim Campbell, the 19th Prime Minister of Canada. Ms. Campbell, the floor is yours. Ms. Campbell, you're on mute. You're still on mute. I did unmute, but hang on. Yes, we hear you. Sorry. Um, Kakashin and I were part of another panel through the International Leadership Association where we discussed some of the great challenges uh, to leadership, even thinking about leadership in the coming years. I'm going to just be, I'll be very brief because I'm surrounded by people who are, are deeply knowledgeable, deeply engaged about these issues. Let me just say three things that strike me. I uh, mean, you know, are we prepared? Um, well, I don't know, but it almost doesn't matter if we aren't because here we are and we have to make the best of where we are. Um, Three things that I think are important. Um, one is the, the sort of reassertion of the value of governance and a particularly good government. One of the things we've seen in the United States is a kind of a, of a cynicism and a discrediting of the role that government plays. And I think the, the new Biden administration, um, you know, really kind of reminds us of what good government looks like. You know, that people with political responsibilities and the responsibility of the state engaging in those responsibilities and responding to them. And as somebody said, Joe Biden is, a, is a, appointing a whole lot of retreads to his cabinet. Thank goodness. Meaning people who actually are experienced and understand how to make the machinery of government work. So I think we really need all of us, um, whether we're retired politicians or recovering politicians like me or people in office or people who work with politicians in uh, the, the major organizations of the world, which are really made up of sovereign states. Um, and therefore what politicians do and what, and what governments do really, really matters. I think restoring the, the, the notion that government um, really has an important role to play. But secondly, that what makes government an instrument of solving our problems is its accountability. 
And I think it's very important for, for new generations and old generations to recommit themselves to the role of democratic citizenship that it really does matter. We've seen the dramatic shift that is now taking place in the United States. And I'm, I'm not gonna pretend my bias. I mean, I'm deeply relieved. It's like a huge weight has been taking off my shoulder, but it matters. And we've seen that Donald Trump had more votes than any other presidential candidate in history, except for the guy who defeated him who had 7 million more votes. So what it means is that people use their votes um, in different ways and people, and we need to understand the importance of engaged democratic citizenship. And that's really the instrument that enables us to get governments to engage in important issues like climate change, like dealing with the pandemic, like dealing with all of the other things that, that, that matter to us. And, and so our, our citizenship is important. But the third thing I would say is, I think um, one of the things that's very worrisome is this whole question of how do we create policy and conversations about policy based on truth based on where we can make the distinction between opinions and different ways we may balance the way we look at things depending on, on our preconceptions. But whereas Daniel Moynihan once said, you're entitled to your own opinion, you're not entitled to your own facts. And it's really scary when we see the extent to which reality can be distorted. And um, you know whether it's artificial intelligence, um, you know, all of these things that, that can, can be, you know, you can create things that seem to be true, uh, videos that, that are total distortions uh, that seem to be somebody speaking and they're not that person. So I think a respect for the truth and a really serious engagement in finding ways to hold communicators uh, uh, and, and communication media to account for truthfulness. We've seen now some social media is pushing, pushing back on, I mean, you know, Donald Trump, it was documented. There's actually it's a Canadian guy uh, named Daniel Dale, who, you know, started out from the Toronto Star and then went on to, to CNN to talk, to document all of his falsehoods. And I think the final count was over 30,000. I mean, it's mind boggling. And what we know is that you, you almost get worn down trying to, it's like playing a ping pong game against a hundred people. You're constantly trying to, to bat the balls again. I mean, and how do you have any energy after to actually think seriously about those issues? So finding ways to restore truthfulness, to, 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 to empower people with mechanisms to test ideas, whether it's through their education, but also uh, policies that create, um, create costs for uh, social media and others who allow distortions to take place knowingly. So I think that's an area of policy. So I think restoring our capacity to find truth and know what it is and test it and recognizing that even in that context, we will have disagreements and we'll put different weights on things uh, depending on, on our values, but that that's important. But that it all goes back to governance that can function, that can address issues. And incidentally, that doesn't mean government's doing everything. It means governments doing what only, gov what, what only governments can do, and at the same time helping to empower NGOs, civil society, individuals to be the most effective people that they can be. And that includes, that means having a sense of engaged citizenship. And incidentally, I just want to say, what I find interesting is that just when I'm ready to throw myself out a basement window, something comes along like GM saying, they're gonna completely do away with internal combustion engine cars, is it by 2030, 2035 or something? I think in climate change, we're now beginning to see kind of tipping points in terms of certain kinds of technologies and certain kinds of responses. And I have always said that it would come down to the money. And I think the fact that there are insurers who will no longer insure uh, people against the, uh, the vagaries of their, uh, their willful negligence, willful denial, and, um, and that, uh, that the, the market um, is now helping, it's not complete, but it's helping to push resources um, and to push companies to uh, invest their resources in ways that will actually address these problems. So I'll stop there, but those are my, my, my uh, observations to begin with. Thank you so much, Ms. Campbell. You're absolutely right. We need to ensure that there's transparency and accountability so that we are able to see the truth and you're right. It is very scary to note that nowadays it's so hard to understand what is the truth because of fake news, because of people 
using social media and other techniques to distort uh, the facts and present it in their own way and uh, labeling them as alternate facts when in reality the truth is what is real and we have to get that uh, out there. So thank you so much for bringing up that very uh, important point. Uh, I would now like to invite our next panelist, Her Excellency Maria Fernanda Espinoza, President of the 73rd United Nations General Assembly and former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Defense, Ecuador. Ms. Maria, the floor is yours. So, muted me and mute myself first. And, uh, and uh, I would, of course, uh, and I'm also a, a proud counselor, uh, as you kick action of the World Future Council, where we uh, really work uh, with the responsibility uh, uh, with uh, for and with uh, future generations. So thank you to the Green Hope uh, Foundation. I think this is a very, very timely discussion. I'm, I'm very honored to share this panel uh, with uh, uh, this group of, of distinguished speakers. I cannot agree more with former Prime Minister Campbell. I think that today's webinar poses a key question. You know, after witnessing the catastrophic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic last year, the question is, you know, how, if, you know, as global citizens, as leaders, uh, that if we have done enough, uh, you know, to uh, address and solve uh, the current uh, multifold crisis unleashed uh, and magnified by uh, the current pandemic. I think that we have to agree that governments, uh, the multilateral system, you know, they all have taken measures to control the pandemic and save lives. Uh, and science has brought us hope with the development of a, of a vaccine, of treatment. The truth is that the pandemic is far from over. I'm, I'm just coming out of a Lancet Commission meeting where there's so many, you know, public health, vaccinologists, epi epidemiologists, and I'm, uh, you know, very honored to be part of that commission. Uh, the situation is not, is not going well, uh, you know. Um, in the best case scenario with an adequate and equal global immunization process, the pandemic could be controlled in one or two years or perhaps more. But, you know, unfortunately, the socioeconomic impact would last longer, especially, especially for uh, the, global, the global South. Uh, basically, I would like to, to uh, share with you today you know, perhaps uh, three ideas. Uh, one is, uh, you know, potential responses to the global socioeconomic and humanitarian impacts of the pandemic. Uh, look at a little bit of the geopolitics and the politics of the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, since I am following that uh, closely. Uh, and uh, what are the true prospects uh, for ending the pandemic and uh, and, uh, and to look very briefly at uh, the recovery funds and other economic measures that have been deployed, you know, to help low and middle income uh, countries. Um, and, and of course, this leads uh, me uh, to perhaps close with some uh, ideas about how important it is to strengthen uh, global, global cooperation and uh, our multilateral system. So I think that uh, what we are uh, witnessing is uh, an increased uh, death toll, uh, more than 2 million, uh, according to official sources, global number of infected people, uh, a staggering number of 100 million people. Uh, and this, of course, is bringing us uh, to witness a collapse of our uh, health systems worldwide and uh, states' capacity to, to save lives. Uh, we were listening today uh, from an expert of South Africa looking at this new variant of the COVID-19 in South Africa and the number of deaths and uh, uh, that it's unfortunately uh, causing. We were also hearing from uh, the IMF uh, director on investment saying that the recession caused by the pandemic uh, is a contraction of close to 4.5% uh, only in 2020. And, uh, and uh, 
apparently, you know, we won't see uh, a world GDP returning to pre-crisis levels until the end of 2022 if things uh, go, go well. And I think that uh, the, the big lesson um, from 2020 has been that the crisis impacted every country, every person, the poorest and the most vulnerable, uh, vulnerable people, of course, were disproportionately affected. And that includes women and girls, children, older persons, persons with disabilities, migrants and refugees, indigenous peoples and on the on the employment and job side of course the informal the informal sector and uh, we we are also worried because um, you, we know that the pandemic has kept 1.6 billion students out of schools and that is uh, in addition uh, worsened by the the huge uh, the huge digital divide you know half of the world does not have access to internet so, um, you know, an increase in extreme poverty, in poverty, unemployment, the figures are really not, uh, not very promising. And what strikes me, and, and I cannot, you know, just be silent on this, it's the issue of inequalities. And uh, uh, according to Forbes, the 10 richest men have seen their fortunes grow by $540 billion since the pan pandemic began. And a recent uh, Oxfam report uh, says clearly that uh, the biggest uh, you know, businesses around the world have recovered their losses in nine months in the pandemic. Well, we know that, uh, for example, we cannot guarantee sufficient funding uh, for uh, ensuring that the developing world has access uh, to the vaccine. So I think that uh, we have to acknowledge uh, that the pandemic has magnified the tensions and paradoxes in our societies. And uh, the pandemic, um, you know, is, is forcing us as societies to find outlets for the many simultaneous crises we are facing. And that of course calls for a critical and radical changes in, in our political, economic and social systems. Like uh, foreign prime minister Campbell was saying, uh, you know, um, on the governance side, on the trust and legitimacy of our democratic institutions, but also in um, the, the access uh, to proper to proper funding. I, I wanted to share with you a little bit of the politics of the COVAX, which is this multi-stakeholder mechanism for access to, to vaccines. I don't think I have the time, but just to let you know that it's not going well, that there is a staggering uh, number of, of uh, uh, of uh, vaccines that are being, uh, you know, bought bilaterally uh, by some countries, uh, uh, you know, and some countries now have five more times the number of vaccines that they actually need, whereas the developing world, uh, most of the uh, poorest countries have not seen one single vaccine uh, yet. And, and that is uh, really uh, worrisome. It, it means that our multilateral system requires a further boost, support, financing. Uh, we have to uh, uh, remember that there is a huge financial gap uh, for COVID, uh, COVAX. Um, you know, COVAX requires between 40 to 50 billion uh, for 2021. And uh, the uh, financial gap is, is huge. Um, we see at the same time that there are huge recovery, financial recovery packages. Uh, but unfortunately, again, we are doing more of the same. We are still investing in fossil fuels. We're, uh, you know, uh, even uh, the, the, the very uh, powerful and, and, and wealthy countries, and there's very little going to uh, meet the 0 0.7 target of official development assistance. Uh, so I think that it is a, a situation that has to call you know, for, for our attention. And I think that uh, this year we have several opportunities to make our voices heard, especially young people, Kikash and you and, and, and the people you work with uh, every day. Uh, I would say that there are several opportunities this year. Uh, there is, uh, I call it uh, the year uh, 
that where we have the opportunity uh, to reconcile uh, with, uh, with nature for the first time ever, uh, we will be having three conferences of the parties of the three major uh, Rio conventions, the climate, the biodiversity, the de desertification uh, conferences of the parties are taking place this year, plus two high level conferences, the oceans conference and the uh, food system summit as well. So there is a need to make sure that uh, it's not that a conference solves the world crisis, but it does help to put together a narrative uh, that would uh, bring um, collective responsibility, proper leadership and commitment. Uh, we have a major opportunity uh, to put, uh, you know, uh, under the, the, the public attention, the women's rights agenda this year. Uh, we have the Generation Equality Forum, which will revamp the women's rights and equality course of action. Uh, first, uh, now in, in March, at the end of March in Mexico, the first forum, and in June uh, in Paris, the second forum. There is a lot of uh, youth uh, involvement and engagement in uh, really crafting uh, the uh, women's rights agenda, uh, but also in tackling the implementation deficit after 25 years of the Beijing uh, conference. So we have the opportunity and the responsibility uh, to take advantage of a time of crisis, but also a, a time of creativity, of reinvention, to help build the political momentum and the willingness to see transformation happen. And that, of course, includes a profound retooling of uh, the UN through uh, what I call a coalition of the willing, including we the peoples, young people, youth, academia, local governments, member states. And, the main goal of multilateral action has to be uh, the, the, the establishment, the building of a new social and political pact uh, that considers the earth system as a common heritage of humankind and the scaffold uh, for our well-being. So this new social contract uh, should allow for a new relationship between society, the economy, politics, and our health system. So we, we do have an unprecedented opportunity to co-build a more just, inclusive, and sustainable order. And back to you, Kikashin, and I'll be more than happy to engage in a conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Maria. And uh, yes, you're absolutely right. This is a time of creativity and reinvention as we build forward towards the new normal. Uh, but you're also right in saying that the pandemic is not over and while it might get over in maybe two to three years, the social and economic impacts will definitely remain and will have continue to have an increased effect on uh, the global south. And it's really horrifying to note uh, about the unequal distribution of the COVAX vaccines and that really makes us question our humanity. So uh, yeah, you're, we're seeing some of the same pre-pandemic trends as well emerging and that's really sad. And that is why dialogues like these are so important where we are actually able to identify these and then implement the actions that are needed on the ground to bring about positive change and rebuild better. So thank you so much, Ms. Maria. I would now like to invite our next speaker, Mr. Luke Nakaja, past executive secretary of the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification and Drought and former Minister of Environment and Urban Development, Benin. Mr. Nakacha, the floor is yours. You're on mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you for having me on this webinar and I'm pleased to join very uh, honorable people uh, on this panel. Uh, 2020, are we ready for 2021? Well, the very fact that youth movement are showing leadership about global crisis issues and critical issues is a reason for us all to be hopeful. Hopeful that uh, we can succeed in humanitizing humanity. That's why I'm very delighted to, to join this panel. Uh, as it has been said by Maria uh, just a few minutes ago, we are not yet out of the woods regarding COVID-19, but there are lessons that we can learn from it. Actually, 2020 has taught us a great deal about how uh, the price humanity can pay 
to adapt when confronted with uh, uh, force majeure. And it will take concerted effort and converging one to make the post COVID-19 era the one that will be a better world. But indeed, we are not yet there. And there is the, why I'm hopeful because I'm seeing leadership from the youth movement. I'm seeing also, you know, the, the, some coalition from the like-minded uh, been working. I'm very much concerned because uh, there are two critical issues that are also overarching crises at, at global level, which we still unfortunately consider as looming because you have chosen to disregard them. And this actually relates to the issue of truthfulness that uh, uh, Honorable Campbell has actually uh, uh, highlighted because those crises are about climate change and biodiversity, biodiversity loss crisis. They are intertwined, have a lot in common with COVID-19 crisis, though there are few major uh, differences. And allow me to maybe highlight what they have in common because we may then know what we take from COVID-19 uh, to actually address those overarching crises that actually are threatening uh, life on the planet. First, they, they are both COVID-19, climate change and biodiversity loss, they are systemic in nature. In nature. They are threat multiplier of existing risk. They are regressive because they disproportionately uh, affect the, the most vulnerable. And they have been scientifically pro predicted. So no one can say it was or it is a black swan for, 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 for us, actually. And another point is that the cost of crisis management vastly uh, is vastly greater than the cost of prevention and the cost of building resilience. And lastly is that the three of them, they, stems, they stem from the tragedy of the commons, which means that individual behaviors and interests lead to depletion of vital life supporting resources. And if we understand that, and we see the price we have been paying to address COVID-19, then we may uh, uh, take a different look at what we may actually face when uh, uh, climate change and global warming will become even more, more uh, present in our life. But it is again important to highlight that climate change and biodiversity loss are intertwined because global warming and biodiversity loss, they, they, they are set in a loop and they fertilize each other. On another end, they also, because they are threat multiplier, they contribute to, to the onset of pandemics like COVID-19. So if we know that, then the time of action is now and should not be postponed for any reason. They, but they do have two major differences. The difference is that though COVID-19 is about, uh, you know, risk of contagion, while uh, uh, climate change and biodiversity law is about risk of accumulation. It comes, it, the risks are accumulated and are slow onset, but give rise to devastating events, which over time increase in severity and fre frequency. The, the, the second difference is the time scale. COVID-19 is a direct and discernible risk. Its time scale is measured in weeks, months, or even a couple of years. But the time scale of global warming and biodiversity crisis are measured in years, decades, and even centuries. So the main challenge we have, the main challenge we have is in taking climate change and biodiversity loss seriously and tackling them as imperatives for our today action is what Mark Carney, former governor of Bank of England has labeled the tragedy of horizon in his famous speech title, Breaking the Tragedy of the Horizon, Climate Change and Financial Stability, and where he stated that once climate change becomes a defined issue for financial stability, it may already be too late. 
And that is not only for financial stability, but just for life. And so according to IPCC, 2020 should be the year that we are supposed to have started curbing our global emission of greenhouse gases, but we are far from being there. And on another hand, biodiversity loss continue to accelerate, leading to more extension of species, which means extension of life on, on the planet. So we know that there will be no vaccine, as you put in your concept notification. We know that there will be no vaccine or no quick fix for those for this rapidly unfolding crisis I have just mentioned. They are cumulative. Their cumulative impact will threaten our very existence on the planet. And it is not about saving the planet. It's about saving ourselves. We must therefore address them now, including by why we are tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. So I have a few suggestions to make here. Because the good news is that investing in climate action and investing in, in nature, they do come with very uh, long-term, high return in, uh, on investment. So this being actually documented by many analysis now, and we hope that the, the issue of truthfulness will lead us these, these days to have a different look or a second look to what has been, uh, what the cost of inaction versus that of action has been made clear for us. So my suggestions are the following. So while we are addressing COVID-19, we must first ensure that COVID-19 economic response plans and stimulus packages are aligned with climate and biodiversity conservation action, as well as the SDGs. The second suggestion I want, I want to make is that the opportunity is to be seized to phase out existing subsidies and investment that accelerate global warming and biodiversity loss. We must phase them out. And the third one is that it is time to really strengthen cooperation and multilateralism and scale up investment to enforce locally led plans and partnerships that invest in nature, address climate change, and expedite the achievement of sustainable development goals, excluding, in, sorry, including in the developing countries, especially in the LDCs. And my final point is uh, we are at least three members of the World Future Council here. So uh, Herbert Giradre, who is the, the co-founder of the World Future Council, he wrote a poem and he has circulated the poem today. And the final word of his poem says, let us not sacrifice tomorrow on the altar of now and today. Over to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Nakacha. And you're absolutely right. The time for action is now and we cannot postpone that for any reason. And of course, uh, while we address COVID-19, we have to ensure that uh, the economic response aligns with climate, with biodiversity conservation, with the SDGs, and really ensure harmony amongst all three pillars of sustainability. And uh, yes, it is time to strengthen multilateralism through locally led solutions. So thank you once again. Our next speaker is Ms. Shannon O'Shea, team leader public partner advocacy, visibility, and the SDGs, UNICEF. Ms. Shannon, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Kikishan, um, for organizing another very excellent and timely webinar uh, and discussion. And I think a number of really great points have already been made by the previous speakers and just picking up on what former Prime Minister Campbell was saying about the importance of having good governance, um, both in terms of being conscientious and also being experienced. And I think all of us can be critical of, of, of governments or of multilateral institutions, including those of us that are part of them. Um, but we can see the devastation of when those things are not functional and empowering. So I think that a lesson that we have learned is the importance of having responsible and accountable government, both at the national level, at the local level, but also through um, a multinational cooperation. 
So when you asked us to speak, Kikashan, I felt like your concept that was very clear in, in kind of defining two um, parallel tracks of, of COVID. First is the immediate health crisis and the response to that health crisis. So the emergency that we're all facing in terms of you know, treating the sick and ensuring that vaccines are rolled out. But then we have the equally important longer term issues, which is the economic and social fallout as a result of the pandemic. And both of them are extremely relevant. And we're at a very critical juncture in terms of the decisions that are made now and budgets that are allocated now in terms of the response and how people will be able to recover from it. So it's really important that we're talking about both of these issues. So I first wanted to talk about the immediate health emergency, which as mentioned is how are we ensuring that um, people aren't getting sick, that those that are sick are being treated and that vaccines are being ro rolled out in an equitable and transparent way. And um, former PGA Espinoza brought this up very, very importantly, which is um, we need to ensure that the vaccines are not just reaching the richest people in the richest countries. It needs to be done in a way that is transparent, uh, that is equitable, and where we're prioritizing the most vulnerable regardless of where they live. Um, and of course, that is people that are more physically vulnerable, like the elderly, to, um, to getting seriously ill or, or dying of the disease, frontline workers, which of course include health workers, but also anyone that is required to be in person for their livelihood, including teachers. Um, and as I mentioned, it cannot just be the richest countries who are, who are able to get all the vaccines first. Uh, it really needs to be done through, through equitable means. And we need to empower the alliance of organizations that are working on COVAX, including WHO, Gavi, uh, UNICEF, in ensuring that we are getting the vaccines to the developing world as well. Um, UNICEF has played a, a historic role in immunization campaigns and vaccines. We're actually the largest single procurer in the world of vaccines. So we have um, procedures and a, a supply division in place that is at the ready to support the rollout of the COVID vaccine. And we're already working with, with key partners in the public and private spheres, spheres for that. Um, but then there's also the, the routine immunization uh, that needs to take place. So we see that healthcare systems have been overwhelmed. And in fact, uh, UNICEF estimates that 80 million children have missed out on routine immunizations in, in 2020 due to healthcare systems just being overwhelmed or in some cases completely uh, shut down and not functioning because of COVID. So how are we looking at rolling out both the COVID vaccine, but also ensuring that there are not continued interruptions to routine immunization is really, really important. The other thing uh, that, that was mentioned, I think Kekashan, you mentioned it at your, in your opening remarks, is the incredible danger of alternate facts and conspiracy theories and misinformation. And we've seen this a lot with, with vaccines and this predates COVID a growing movement of, of people that are getting um, completely false information about the safety and efficacy of vaccines and then spreading that information like wildfire to other people who, who then believe this information. And this has led to huge outbreaks of diseases that for decades have been on the decline. So we've seen big outbreaks in infectious diseases like measles because of this. So UNICEF also has a huge role to play in how we can combat misinformation. Um, we're, we're a globally recognized brand. We have close to 100 million followers on social media. So really we see a, a big role for us in communicating to our different followers about what are the, what are the real facts? What is, what is the information that you should be trusting? and how vaccines uh, are, are a part of keeping yourself safe and healthy. So as we know, there's the kind of health piece of it, but as I mentioned um, previously, there's also the kind of social and economic fallout. 
And what we're seeing right now is, is governments around the world are working on um, their budgets for response and recovery. And hundreds of billions of dollars are going to be put towards this over the coming months and years as we respond and recover from the pandemic. And we need to ensure that these plans and budgets are not just protecting, um, but improving children's health, education, and safety for the future. Children are not as physically vulnerable to becoming seriously ill or dying of COVID. And you know, that's, that's a good thing. Um, but to say that they are not affected by COVID is completely inaccurate. And I wanted to just share a couple of statistics on this. Over 92% of children globally have been affected by school closures. That's 1.8 billion with B children. And out of those, over 400 million of them have no access whatsoever to online learning during this time. So these are already the most vulnerable children and young people, and they're gonna fall even further behind because of this massive disruption to their education. And we also know, unfortunately, there's millions of them that will likely never return to school because of this disruption. As I mentioned previously, um, we're also seeing interruptions to, to routine healthcare. So 80 million children, UNICEF estimates, that did not receive um, life-saving vaccines through routine, uh, routine immunization campaigns. And now those children are vulnerable to becoming ill or dying of diseases that are easily preventable. We're also seeing troubling increases in child labor due to children being out of school and families facing economic hardship um, due to job losses and economic slowdown and domestic violence against women and children has been really on the rise um, with victims being forced to shelter in place with their abusers while at the same time not having access to teachers and social workers who are often the first line of defense in identifying cases of domestic abuse and violence. So all of these issues need to be explicitly addressed in COVID-19 response and recovery packages, or else we're going to see over the long term that the COVID-19 crisis is going to be a child rights crisis, and it's going to be a child rights crisis for a long time, for a generation of children at least, especially those that were already marginalized to begin with. So UNICEF and a number of our partners have developed what we call a six-point plan to not only protect children now, but to establish a new and better normal for the future. I think a lot of us are, are nostalgic um, for return to normal life as we lived it before the virus. But for millions of children around the world, normal was not good enough in any way, shape or form. Their basic rights were not being fulfilled. So it's not just returning to normal, it's returning to much better than normal and creating a new normal. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of the details of our six point plan. You can find it online, but I'll, I'll give you the headlines. First is to ensure that all children are learning, including by closing the digital divide. Uh, second is guaranteeing access to health and nutrition services and making vaccines affordable and available to every child. Third is supporting and protecting the mental health of children and young people and bringing an end to gender-based violence, abuse, and neglect. Fourth is increasing clean, access to clean water, sanitation, and hygiene, and addressing environmental degradation and climate change. And I know that this was brought up um, very strongly by some of the previous speakers, um, but nature has given us a warning sign with uh, this pandemic. And if we don't heed it, this is not going to be a one-off for a black swan event. We will continue to be on a collision course with nature if we're not rectifying our relationship with the planet and the species that we share the earth with. Um, number five is reducing child poverty and ensuring an inclusive recovery for all. And number six is redoubling our efforts to protect and support children and their families living through conflict, disaster, and displacement. So I'm, I'm going to, to wrap up, but I wanted to just um, leave you with one final thought. Uh, UNICEF uh, actually celebrates our anniversary this year. It's our 75th anniversary. And our organization, like, like the UN itself, was created out of the ashes of a world that had been devastated by 
World War II. And now here we are in, in 2021 and we're facing devastation of a different type, which is that which was caused by the pandemic. And UNICEF is really proud of the fact that we were part of this post-World War II movement that saw countries recover and thrive after the war and where the quality of life indicators for many people across the world improved after that. So again, it wasn't just kind of recovering and going back to normal, but recovering even better. And we are 100% committed to being part of the movement that's going to recover from COVID-19 and build this world that is better than what we had before the virus took hold. A world that's fairer, a world that's greener, a world that is safer, and where every child has the potential um, to fulfill their full potential and to live lives of purpose and dignity. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Ms. Shannon. And yes, that is our hope to rebuild the world and go into the new normal that is just equitable and sustainable. And you are absolutely right. If we don't act now, mm. COVID-19 will become even more of a child rights crisis. Mm. So uh, yeah, normal was definitely not good enough for many children before the pandemic. The pandemic highlighted the gross inequalities of our world. So yes, rebuilding better and building forward better is absolutely crucial. And it's really nice to hear about what UNICEF is doing to tackle this crisis, both in the short term and long term. And it's horrifying to note that the number of children who did not receive uh, immunization that made them vulnerable to diseases that can be cured. But thank you so much for sharing that with us today. Our next speaker is Mr. Joseph de Cruz. Special Advisor, Strategic Planning and Innovation, Executive Office of the Administrator of the United Nations Development Program. Mr. DeCurse, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kakashin, and um, thank you all um, my colleagues for those really insightful um, perspectives on where we are and where we're going. Um, I was listening carefully to the various interventions um, so that I could try and pick up from where you left off rather than going over ground that's been covered already. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit from our perspective about what we sense is likely to be needed for us as a global community for human civilization to be able to come out of this experience in a more positive way. I think we've all already discussed at great length the shock of the COVID pandemic and touched on the fact that it not only has implications that resonate across a number of domains, impacts on jobs, on livelihoods, on education, on health, on, on mental health, um, on the environment, et cetera, but that the responses we need to provide in this context also speak to that need to deal with the many other issues. Luke, I think you spoke to this very eloquently that have been bedeviling us for a long time the climate emergency, the devastation of our, bio, of our biodiversity, et cetera. Now, the challenge we face there is, how do we do that? It's easy to look at the scale of the challenge in front of us in its constituent pieces, and somewhat as a global community, throw our hands up in the air and go, you know what, this is all just too much. Um, maybe I can focus on this thing, or I can focus on that. Or, and this is very rational, I will just focus on protecting me and mine. I will focus on what sits within my borders. I will focus on what sits within my community. I will focus on what sits within my family or myself. And I think transcending that dilemma is probably the biggest challenge we face as we come out of this experience. How do we build a global conversation that recognizes two eyes? That first of all, these challenges that we face are all deeply interconnected. And it is not possible in the world today to look at a pandemic crisis that's driven by zoonotic disease that's linked to environmental degradation as an isolated incident of a health issue. Nor is it possible to look at a world today where any shock, a viral outbreak in one part of the world can so dramatically affect us on so many levels because we are so deeply interconnected. So we need to start developing 
in a collective approach that understands and recognizes the interconnectedness of the challenges we face and builds a new language and a new set of structures and institutions to deal with these as complex systemic integrated problems. And secondly, the other interconnectedness that I think we all need to, to redouble down on to really bring to the fore is the inextricable interconnectedness amongst all of us. And in some respects, I think the, the viral pandemic was a useful shock to the system because it demonstrated that many of the challenges we face today are challenges that we cannot isolate ourselves from, whether behind nation state boundaries, whether behind borders of a privilege of, of elitism, of access to resources and wealth. The kind of challenges the world faces today climate emergency, inequality, health crisis, et cetera, are not things we can as individuals, as families, as countries run away from. So if you take those two points together, that these challenges are interconnected and that the response to this has to be an interconnection amongst all of us. And if you agree that both of those are inescapable, then what does that speak to in terms of how we respond to this? And I would argue, and I certainly speak for many of us in UNDP on this, that it speaks to the need to build systems and structures that help us collectively recognize and respond to these emergent challenges when they happen, and to invest in those as a collective good, because that is the only solution. Now, that sounds self-evident, particularly for someone who, who is an international civil servant of the UN. We need better multilateral institutions. We need stronger global systems of coordination and governance. I'm not simply making a pitch today to say, you know, we need more of the UN and this type of work. I recognize that the way in which multilateral systems, international organizations operate, also needs to evolve dramatically to respond to these kind of crises. So we have a lot to do within our systems to get out of our silos, to stop perhaps speaking of ourselves so much and recognizing the systems and structures we need to build. But the base of this has to be a global shared sense at all levels, not just by governments, but by people and others, that we need these multiplicity of platforms through which we can work together. Beyond multilateral systems, coming back Kekashan, to the work that you and others do, it is this interconnection amongst like-minded people coalitions of the willing, the willing to act as well as to talk, young people, activists, and others. And if I come back to you know, a lot of what um, uh, Maria Fernanda Espinosa has been saying also as president of the PGA, um, I love the fact, ma'am, that you refer to we the people so often, because that is really the core of what the United Nations is about. And I think we need to start rediscovering that capacity of our UN system to be able to mobilize inspire and activate coalitions of action across the range of issues we're working on today. And we within the UN system need to become much better at being the system, the structure, the facilitator, the empower of those kinds of actions. So I lay that there as a reflection, building very much on what was said by all of you preceding rather than trying to, to go over the same ground again. And maybe turn back also once Catherine's spoken to, to sort of ask the question, well, how do we get in that direction? How do we start building these systems and structures? Because I think that is the one thing we need to do out of this so that we can start dealing with the multiplicity of challenges we face as an integrated global community. Kekshan, thank you for the opportunity. Looking forward to hearing the rest of the discussion. Thank you so much, Joseph, for sharing your views with us today. And thank you for highlighting uh, the interconnectedness amongst all of our world's challenges, as well as amongst us as human beings. And you're absolutely right. The challenges that we face today, and the virus has demonstrated this, there are challenges that we cannot isolate ourselves from. And we definitely need all stakeholders working together and bringing their own unique skill sets to the table so that we're really able to uh, rebuild better, uh, combat the virus, combat the challenges that the virus has posed to us in not just the health sense, but in other areas as well as well as the long-term impacts uh, and the challenges that were already there before. So thank you so much for highlighting that. And I would now like to invite our next speaker, Ms. Katrin Harvey, 
who is the Chief Operating Officer of the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens. Ms. Harvey, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kekeshan, and thank you everybody who went before me. This has been very inspiring and I feel very blessed to be on a panel with such distinguished speakers. Um, much of what I wanted to say has been said, as going the last one is always hard, um, but I would like to focus a little bit more on, on what we actually do as the Ban Ki-moon Center and how we inspire young people and women to take action. Um, if we look at human history, of course, we've overcome quite a lot of things and we have been able to build back better as Shannon has already mentioned. And so, um, yes, 2020 has been a very difficult year and 2021 proves to be another difficult year ahead of us. But for example, 2020 was also the year that we managed to wipe out polio. So we have to also keep hope and see where we've actually had been, have been able to, to conquer some of these challenges. Um, yeah, we all understand if we talk about these issues is that it's often the poorest who are served first when it comes to problems and issues and crisis and served last when it comes to solutions and cures. And yes, the, the vaccinations are a shining light at the end of a very long and dark tunnel for all of us, but that shining light is much brighter if you have the privilege of being born in a more developed countries in a higher income country. Um, I want to, I remember, I read an article by uh, where um, the, the Director General of the WHO said that just about 10 days ago, he said that 40 million vaccinations had already been administered in the, in the global north and 25 in one of the lowest income countries. That's 25, zero, nothing else. And that's shocking. And it shows how uh, the selfishness of the more privileged really undermines the, the, the activities and the efforts put into by the global community to come to an equitable and effective solution. Because if we don't solve this pandemic for all of us, we're all gonna pay in lives and in money. Uh, so what we do at the Ban Ki-moon Center is we build what we do on the two big legacies of uh, the former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, which is the SDGs and the, global, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement. And Last year as well, we've also entered the decade of action to actually implement these two huge frameworks. And we have to really start looking at the problems that I think came up today quite a lot uh, that we have and turning the problems of today and turning them into opportunities of tomorrow. And we have to look at the SDC, SDGs, especially the 17 of them in, in exactly the kind of interconnectedness that Joseph mentioned. They go together, they work together, one of them um, if, you, if you tackle one of them, it will be affected by and have an effect on all of the others. They work in a systemic and holistic way, and this is the kind of information we want to bring out to the world. Um, we know that many people and most of the people of the world have heard of the SDGs and we're five years down the road, um, but only about half of them are somewhat familiar, if at all. So it, this is shocking and we really want to focus on bringing the SDGs towards the more global public and showing um, everybody, like the person on the street, that this is important, that we're all in this together as all nations have signed up to him. And we all agree that this needs to, be, needs to happen for a safer world, for peace and prosperity, for partnerships around the world. Um, so if we look at, of course, we can just dissect, as I think some of you have already mentioned, the different dimensions of sustainability, the environmental basis that needs to happen if you have a safe and um, resilient environment, you can build on that for social engagement and social advocacy. And then once you have these two layers in place, then you can start thinking about economic um, development and, and actually finding a way that economy can, and, and economics can thrive. Um, however, we have to start somewhere. Uh, we can't just tackle all of them at the same time. It's overwhelming, everybody's gonna get lost. Uh, so for example, what we've done uh, just recently this week, we've partnered with the, the Global Center on Adaptation on focusing on climate. Um, on, on you know, calling out leaders and asking them to commit to take action towards climate adaptation. Obviously, this tackles SDG 13 climate action, but it also affects SDG 1 poverty because it looks at livelihoods of farmers, SDG 2 hunger because, again, these farmers produce our food, SDG 3 because health, which meaning that if you have good food, you actually are healthy, SDG 4 because it also looks at 21st century skills, it looks in, into sustainability, in, in, education so there's and I could go on I could get all three or 17 but I'm just gonna beat a dead horse here um 
Now, who is going to do this? Of course, again, uh, we need this global, le global leadership. We need everybody to work together. We need strong multilateral partnerships. And uh, us as well, even uh, coming from Austria at the moment, and we've been very, very happy to see that the President Biden took over and we see that we're moving in the right direction again. But for us at the center, we focus very strongly on empowering and unleashing the power of young people and women. Those two groups together are 75% of global population. And still they are massively underrepresented in any decision-making uh, situations. And we wanna change that. So we wanna really empower women and young people to take action, to become leaders. We have uh, leadership trainings, we have online courses, we do mentoring programs. So to give them this knowledge and the feeling um, that they can actually do something and then we make them do something. So we have SDG micro projects that they, these um, fellows and mentors and scholars, they have all kinds of different names for us. They're all young leaders or women leaders. They implement these projects and then we help them, we guide them along the way. So we um, take them, we help peer to peer exchange. We, um, we have incentive speakers. So I see a lot of them that could potentially end up as intensive incentive speakers for us here in the webinar. Also to look into things like uh, the things that are more difficult, like financing their programs, um, measuring their impacts. And so we really, the, what we want to get into their minds, and I think this is something that we could all get into our minds, is I like to see and identify a problem, find a solution, and then do something about it. So this global citizen mindset is really important that is the core of our work. And we've had some tremendous results. We have a range of SDG micro projects that go from um, youth led peace discussions in Afghanistan to female entrepreneurship for clean energy in Mongolia. We have a SDG based podcast in Saudi Arabia. Katrin, we seem to have lost you. Your screen has frozen. All right, I think I was stuck for a second. I'll go back to the podcast in Saudi Arabia. Did you hear that? Okay. Uh, we have uh, young girls empowerment programs in Rwanda. We have uh, solar lighting programs for school kids in Ghana. There is a even one of our scholars who is using geospatial meteorological data to help farmers in Kenya become less um, um, exposed to, to climate risks. Uh, so it's amazing. And we've been in operational for three years and we've already had 100 of these projects running that have in turn touched 700,000 lives. Uh, so actually, I think we should stop talking about micro at this point. Um, so now if we look at, you know, if we ask how are we going to tackle all of these challenges because it's a lot and it's so much that we have to do and we want to be better than before and we have to still get out of this pandemic. Um, on the one hand, uh, it really is uh, calling out your leaders or like really going out there and talking to the people in power or asking them or demonstrating and campaigning uh, political as well as business leaders to do better, to take action and to really have a world that works. Um, and I think I, we're kind of in this conversation today, correct me if I'm wrong, we've actually been quite lenient on the businesses at the moment. So I think this is really important to call them out just as much as the political leaders and the multilateral cooperation. Um, and then again, take the opportunity to become the leader and take action yourself. We have nine years left for the SDGs for the Paris Climate Agreement. We have to re-energize our efforts. We have to continue building the alliances. Um, and we really have to get into the minds of the people in power that they should stop thinking in the short term planning and into their uh, election focuses, but really start thinking in the big picture and what is really needed. Um, so yes, I think we really have to, we are all in this together and we have to, the pandemic has shown us and has taught us that we can only make things work if we work together across borders, across political agendas. Um, so this is something that we really need. And I think personally think that the climate change is the most imminent and challenging issue that we're facing right now as it said, but also as it exacerbates so many of the other challenges and crises that we're facing. It, had a, it will has, have an effect on the food crisis. It'll have an effect on the poverty crisis, on the um, imminent economic crisis that we're facing as we come out of this pandemic at some point. Um, so as a center, we focus on really fostering and building these next, this next generation of leaders 
who, who really have this global citizen mindset and really think and act like global citizens and encompass the values that this, that this brings along, which means being creative and being innovative and really commit to peace, human, human rights and sustainable development. And I think that's it for me from now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Catherine. And uh, yes, you're absolutely right. The poorest are served first with the problems and last with the solutions. But it's really amazing to hear about what the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens is doing. And we were able to see so many uh, connections with uh, what Green Hill Foundation does too. And it's very exciting to hear about that. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And we definitely, as you said, have to keep up hope and see where we've been able to conquer some of the challenges and then of course uh, rebuild better in that and learn from the best practices shared through that. So thank you so much and thank you so much to all of our panelists for that in very, very enriching dialogue and I'm sure we have questions from our audience. I do see raised hands. So our first question is from Lauren. So Lauren, I'm promoting you to a panelist. So let's see. And our next questions are from Anshita and Tanya. I too will be promoting them to panelists. Lauren, the floor is yours. Uh, Lauren, we are unable to hear you. Can she maybe type her question? Yes, that I think will be possible. And we are still not able to hear you, Lauren. If you can type your question or we'll come back to you. We do have our other uh, attendees here as well. So uh, Lauren, we shall come back to you. Uh, the next person I have is Anshita. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you, panelists, for this amazing discussion. My name is Anshita and I'm from India. My question is to all the panelists. What reform should we bring in the education system to make it easier for the children, especially girls, to return to schools? Thank you, Anshita. Would any of our panelists like to answer that? Uh, Ms. Shannon, um, yeah, I was going to say, I, I can start. Yeah, um, why don't you ask Shannon to start first? <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that question, Anshita. Um, it's a really important one. And I'm not an education expert, so I'm not going to be able to speak to all of the specifics of this. But UNICEF um, is embarking on something we're calling Reimagine Education, which is a major campaign about how we not only you know, address the educational challenges that we're finding with COVID, but that we are addressing challenges that existed before COVID, including access for girls. And one of the things that I think is really important, and I had mentioned that there's over 400 million children that haven't had access to online. It's probably even um, more acute for girls um, and not always easy to tell because within a household, you often find that control over um, communications channels, including the internet, including um, mobile phones, including the computer is denied with girls. Uh, it's often uh, only the males that have access to um, these channels within the household and certainly they're prioritized. So I think that one of the things that we need to look at in terms of equitable um, access is also within households including uh, online access. Um, in terms of, of some of the, the other education things that we need to do that, that, that we've seen that existed um, before COVID is the, the need for there to be things like um, 
water sanitation and hygiene facilities for girls and women that are separate. So one of the things that we have seen a lot is that we're seeing more gender parity at the um, primary level, but then when girls enter adolescence, they start to drop off in terms of going to school. And a lot of this has to do with not having access to um, female-friendly uh, water sanitation and hygiene. So this is, I think, uh, a really big thing. Uh, the other thing is making sure that education is actually speaking to what children need in the 21st century that is preparing them for the jobs that are going to exist. And this is for, true for both boys and girls, um, but especially, you know, acute for, for girls and women to have education that is speaking to relevant skills that they will need to be financially independent as they move into adulthood. So these are just a, a few things. I don't want to take up too much time. I know there's a lot of questions, um, but I welcome you to also take a look at our um, education materials on our website and particularly our Reimagine campaign, which starts to outline some of the things that we believe will be important for, for building back education systems that are better and better for girls. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shannon. Uh, would any of our other panelists? Yes, Mr. Nakadja. Yes, I would like to add to what she has just said. Uh, there are some very practical things that we need to do uh, to address the barrier to entry for people, girls living, especially in the uh, rural areas, as well as in some of the urban areas where there's no energy and there's no access to digital services. The, this is something that could be done nowadays because we know that uh, we could have decentralized energy production systems such as solar energy. We could, uh, and this could be done uh, because the costs nowadays are so affordable that we could prioritize that. We could also make sure that decentralized ap approaches to addressing COVID-19 is in place. Unfortunately, if you look at the COVID-19 uh, 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 responses in many of those countries, very little has been done in consultation with uh, actually the, the people, the mayors and, and all those working closer to uh, the needy. So this is something that we may also consider. Thank you so much. And uh, I see Catherine, your hands raised. I just have a very quick one. Peeling on what Shannon said, I think uh, we have to really quite be quite explicit here. Um, period education about menstruation is really important so that and really giving access to pads and these kinds of things to be very, very explicit, not just the facilities in the schools, but really just also being able to go to school any time of the month. Um, also, building on what Luke said, we had um, Access to energy sounds so simple, but it's really, really important because often girls, especially in, in low income countries, are the ones who have to go for, look for firewood and things like that and are the first ones to be taken out of school when it comes to that. And lastly, I think this is the world over. We have to um, get girls uh, interested in STEM top topics and really see that they can take away that stigma of how girls cannot do science and cannot do math. I think this is a big, big awareness raising campaign that still needs to happen the world over. And this is nothing to do with developing of developed countries. It really is anywhere in the world still a big issue. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Ms. Maria, you had your hand raised. Yeah, but, you know, very, very quickly, just uh, to add uh, the you know, staggering uh, numbers on how many children in general are out of school and doing homeschooling, the ones that can do it, uh, you know, 1.8 billion kids are out of school. And of course the numbers for girls are higher. And uh, even prior to the pandemic, uh, 132 million girls were out of school. And if you add to that a, a huge um, uh, technology access gap between boys and girls, you know, girls have less access to, uh, to uh, a, a smartphone, uh, to, uh, uh, there is a digital exclusion and inequality among girls uh, as well. Uh, 
and there are factors that uh, you know makes things more difficult perhaps which is uh, uh, during the pandemic the increase of of genital mutilation uh, among girls uh, increasing numbers of child child marriage uh, and as mentioned digital access so i think that in terms of uh, affirmative action policy towards, uh, uh, you know, education, quality education, access to school, uh, you know, uh, close uh, the digital gap, etc. Uh, there is a need for affirmative action policies towards uh, girls, uh, especially in the developing world. But not only, I have to say, if you look at numbers uh, in the US, uh, especially among the migrant Latino and African American communities, then you would be surprised, you know, what happens there uh, as well. So there is a, a lot of work to do. I, I think that UNICEF has a strong role, especially as it works with the country teams at the local, at the local level, of course. Thank you, Ms. Maria. Uh, Joseph, you have your hand raised. Just very quickly. Um, hi, Anchita. I think you've had some really rich answers to the question you just asked. So I'm going to answer a slightly different question, which is, if I was a young person today, what would I be looking to get out of an education system? And I would say what I'd be looking to get out of an education system today is how do I enhance my creativity? How do I enhance my ability to be able to think up, create, develop, new things, whatever those things are, whether they are tangible things in technology, whether they're creative things in arts. I think the future is going to depend a lot on people who are able to harness their creativity. I would think about how can I learn flexibility? How can I learn adaptability? We've talked a lot about the fact that we're going to be dealing with the world for generations to come with a lot of emergent challenges, a lot of changes happening. So how can I learn the skills to be flexible and adaptive? And how would I learn the skills to be able to communicate, to build trust and to influence people? So to me, I would consider any education system that helps young people build these three assets as being the kind of education system you need. Thank you so much. And I am cognizant of time. So I will uh, take three questions at once and then I shall ask the panelists to respond. So uh, Lauren, Let's hope your audio works this time. The floor is yours. Um, hello, everyone. I'm sorry for the technical issue earlier. Um, uh, I am Lauren from Green. I am Lauren from Oman. Thank you, panelists, for this wonderful dialogue. My question is to all the panelists. How can stopping or reversing land degradation contribute to rebuilding better? Can it contribute to solutions such as creating local circular economies in rural populations. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, who would like to go first? Mr. Nakacha, since you were with UNCCD, would you like to answer that first? Yes, indeed. And in, in most of the vulnerable uh, communities in the developing countries, uh, the first resources that they have and they depend on, that is their life supporting uh, resource is land and water. Unfortunately, land degradation will take away both from them. So if you want to bring them back into local economy, uh, we need to help them actually understand where there's potential for restoring their degraded land that are not marginal land. We should stop. Actually, I used to ask scientists, please stop calling degraded land marginal land, because as you do that, you are keeping investment away from them. So back to the question, we, we need to help people understand out of the vast you know, lessons learned from how we could restore degraded land and where they could start from. What are the smallest steps that they could take at their level to restore the productivity of the land? And that's how they can create actually a circular economy in their local community. Of course, they will still remain uh, the question of access to market. Because if you produce and you can't have access to market, then there's no reason to restore. So to cut a probably a long, a long answer short, indeed, the starting point in most of the developing countries, especially in the LDCs, 
land is the first resource. And when you, you teach them, you teach local communities where to start from in restoring the land, this is the first step actually for a much more virtual uh, access to uh, the economy and to the possibility that they have at hand. Amazing, thank you so much. And I know I said I'm gonna take the questions together. So I will take the two questions and then uh, Ms. Campbell, I saw your hand raised. So I shall give you the floor. So the next uh, person I call on is Tanya. You have the floor. Hello everyone, uh, am I audible? Yes. Oh. Hello everyone. Thank you panelists for such an engaging discussion. I am Tanya from Bangladesh. My question is for all the panelists, the gap between developed nations and the global South has widened during the pandemic. Since each country is focused now on their own internal recovery, what leadership steps need to be taken and by who to address this inequality? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, Pragna, you have the floor. Uh, once again, thank you so much to all the panelists for uh, such an insightful uh, discussion. Uh, I'm Pragna from UAE, uh, and my question is to all the panelists. Uh, what can be done to make the uh, UN system more accessible to young people or women, especially those who don't live in USA or Europe? We have seen the major group uh, system, but we know that it is not enough uh, due to there still being various obstacles. So what more can be done? Thank you. Thank you, Pragna. And uh, the first hand I had seen was Ms. Campbell, so you have the floor. Just very quickly, uh, the, all of these questions are excellent ones and they require longer, more complex answers, but just quickly about land degradation. This is not something that only applies to the developing world. Even in developed countries, land degradation, largely through extractive industries. And I think that the, the countries of these companies that are very often contributing to that land degradation need to uh, see the importance of holding them accountable uh, to provide the resources to reclaim land. I think once you do that, then the question of how that land can be reintegrated into a local economy uh, is, not, is not so difficult. To the extent that land is degraded by climate change, uh, that's, that's a different issue. And I think communities have to be able to make those judgments. But I think that, um, uh, and in, also in terms of the north-south inequality, again, I think that the, uh, the developed countries have to take a much uh, bigger role. Um, I'd like to think as Canadians that we're open to doing that, but none of us is as good as we should be. But I think mobilizing a global public opinion, particularly among young people, who can mobilize the public opinion among young people in the developed countries that very often can put moral pressure on their governments to be more responsible global citizens can be helpful. But all of these are issues that, that uh, apply to us as well. And I think going back to my concern about, about political power and gay citizenship, I think globally young people have an opportunity to create alliances um, in countries where that the, the governments and the societies have the resources to address many of these questions and need to see the moral imperative for doing it. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Uh, would any of our other panelists like to answer any of the questions? And I am looking at the time and I would request our panelists to be able to stay on for maybe 10 more minutes so that we are able to address some uh, more questions. Uh, yes, Ms. Maria. Well, I wanted to thank you for the questions, uh, uh, Lauren and Pragna, Tanya. I think they're, you know, right on uh, the, the critical issues, you know, how to make the UN more accessible, how to guarantee uh, a space at the table for young voices. You know, as president of the General Assembly, I made sure that we went beyond, you know, tokenistic youth participation, uh, you know, to bring them at the table to discuss uh, with member states, with academia. Uh, they are, you know, building mechanisms uh, already uh, at the climate change negotiations. But I think that uh, what we need are predictable, uh, you know, full quality participation uh, for, uh, for young people, 
in young uh, change makers. And uh, I think that we have a golden opportunity. As you know, in the uh, UN 75 political declaration, there is uh, a request to the Secretary General to provide, to come up with a report that is, as I understand, going to be delivered this September on a roadmap for a profound retooling of the multilateral system. You know, we do have like a bureaucratic um, uh, inwards uh, reform process that is ongoing that I, you know, I had supported as foreign minister, as president of the General Assembly, these three pillars on peace and security, the development pillar and uh, the management pillar. But in this opportunity, we are speaking about the reform of the main organs of the UN. You know, that is really, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a game changer, you know, for, for reform and for retooling. And uh, a, I, there is a lot of movement and conversation and discussion, several coalitions looking at, at, at how to come up with a built-in mechanism, predictable, institutionalized to ensure that the voices of, of we the people uh, of, of young change makers like you, you know, are part of the table of the decision making, understanding that, of course, the UN is an intergovernmental space, but uh, we have to have a say, you know, it, and it's very much connected to the mandates of the, of the UN Charter. After 75 years, I think it is about time. So uh, I am uh, personally very involved uh, with that, making sure that uh, you know the Secretary General has a big responsibility in his hands, but uh, I and I he has put you know a whole team to work with him uh, on that. So I have great hopes, and uh, but we do have an opportunity uh, to at least have a strong roadmap for a profound uh, reform of the UN uh, main uh, main organs, and and uh, I think that. Um, you have, uh, you are, uh, you know, change makers by nature. You, you are uh, better networked, better connected. Uh, you understand very well the agenda. I don't need to tell you how important your voice and agency is uh, here and today uh, as we uh, rebuild our world and society, how we build back better. And Joseph was saying it is human and natural when you are in crisis or you feel threatened just to look at yourself, your family, your borders and protect yourself. But we have understood and perhaps the strongest message from the COVID pandemic is a phrase that, you know, we repeat it so much that it loses meaning, but it's so important. No one is safe until everybody's safe. And that is valid for vaccine distribution and deployment. It is true for uh, climate change, it is true for disarmament, you know, it is true for inequalities. So I, I think there is a, a, a lot of work ahead of us and we collectively have a great, great uh, shared responsibility to co-build a better world. And thank you. Back to you, Kikashan and friends. Thank you so much, Ms. Maria, uh, Mr. Nakachi, and then Ms. Shannon. Yes, thank you. Just a, a few words because uh, Maria has actually well elaborated on those two questions of Tanya and Pragna. Uh, yes, the greatest inequality we can see actually now unfolding in addressing COVID-19 is what someone have, uh, has called vaccine nationalism. And yes, we need to bring uh, those of the developed countries who for some reason, some of them may have some rationale, but at, uh, as a whole, it doesn't work for few to have access to vaccine and some do, uh, do not to have access to it because this will just sustain the pandemic. So we need to really make sure that we address that and that we end up making in one way or the other, the vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine as a public good uh, for access to all. That's the only way that the world will be safe from that pandemic and those to come. And finally, from the question from Pratna, how to make the UN system uh, more accessible to the youth? We need to learn from the, um, the disruption that we have to come up with in the context of the managing the 
the pandemic. For instance, we need to, to learn from uh, how to use, you know, the digital revolution within the management system of the UN in reaching out and ensuring that the youth are participating. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Natasha. Uh, Ms. Shannon and then Catherine. Thanks so much. I'll be very brief uh, in the interest of time, but just wanted to pick up on this um, question about participation, which is such an important one. And I think it's really important that it's child and youth participation. Uh, I feel like there's sometimes a bit of confusion that when you say youth participation, that it's inclusive of um, children under 18. And we find in practice that's often not the case. And of course, it's important for youth to be able to participate, young people in their late teens and their early 20s. But it's a very different perspective than hearing from someone that's 10 or 12. And we need both of those. I know, Keikashan, you were, I think, 12, if my memory is serving correctly, when you served as a, a participant in Rio Plus 20. And we see the face of the climate movement being Greta Thunberg, who was a child when she started that movement. So it's to our detriment if we're not also bringing in younger voices, um, including children under the age of 18. It is their right as enshrined in the CRC and the UN needs to be conscious of uh, not just including the voices of youth, but including children and youth. Totally agree with that. Uh, Katrin, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you for these really um, difficult questions, uh, and I've had some time to think about them. So coming back to the land degradation question, I think there are several things we can do. There is, on the one hand, very practically, um, starting to engage with, with more resilient farming practices so that it doesn't get degraded, degraded in the first place. And then when we go back to the lands, that, that, that we can use practices that really work, and then we can use new technologies in a way that works in the different situations. But it also means uh, being doing better in, 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 in assigning land rights to different individuals, women especially. And then in a global, more, more bigger picture, also coming back to some, some, something that somebody else said, is like really regulating and making sure that we are coherent in our policies, that it doesn't even get to the point where we have degraded land. Um, secondly, on the north-south divide, uh, Yes, this vaccine nationalism is a dangerous thing because we won't do it. We won't be able to get it done without uh, working together. Um, I love um, Minister Campbell's idea of campaigning. I, we've seen so many times already how campaigning has really made an effort, um, effect uh, using social media and TikTok and so on. This is really easy. And I think the pandemic has shown us that you can really start a huge campaign from your desks and from your homes, from your phones. Um, and lastly, I think it is up to our political leaders, to the to the heads of government, to really start thinking in a sense that um, how we have to reshift the global access to the vaccines, because they, on the one hand, we have the West um, trying desperately to get as many vaccines as possible for their countries, and at the same time complaining that the Chinese are distributing the vaccines. So they have to start seeing that this is a, a global shift that is happening, and they have to really take charge and work together and, and make sure that it's equitable and it works in a system that is global. And lastly, and a very, very short answer to the question of getting more youth, uh, more equitable youth access to the UN, and it's a very practical answer as well, is like start giving them paid internships, stop making them work for free for years. I think this is one big step in the right direction. And so that's it from my end, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Joseph, the floor is yours. Catherine, that was a perfect handoff because that was exactly one of the things that I wanted to point out. Um, we have actually just recently um, in our leadership instituted a policy in UNDP to make our internships paid precisely because it provides access to people who otherwise would not be able to come in. Um, but I wanted to touch on this question of providing young people and women access to the UN because I think to me that's hugely important. And let me start with the obvious. Huge credit, first of all, again, to the PGA for the leadership you've been giving on, on creating platforms for this. Because I think in the UN, we recognize we need a greater diversity of voices. We talk about the challenges the world is facing, the speed at which things are changing, the new kinds of challenges we're facing. Everything you learn in management science tells you diversity is a strength in that context. 
So the UN genuinely needs more younger voices, more female voices, more voices from the South. Our paid internships, even if you're not an intern, you know, there are opportunities through the online UN volunteering program that United Nations volunteers run. We've built a network of accelerator labs in 92 of our country offices in pretty much the entire developing world now, staffed and run mostly by young people whose job it is to reach out and connect and find solutions makers and amplify the work they're doing. So there are platforms out there, there are opportunities. And I would say actually, like everyone else, I deeply welcome young people who want to engage and become part of the United Nations. I think as a vocation, it is a tremendous privilege to serve the UN. And if you have the opportunity to do so, you should really try and pursue that with real passion. So thank you very much for that question. Thank you very much. And uh, I have requested those who had raised their hands earlier and who weren't able to ask their questions to send them to us and we shall send it over to our panelists. But thank you so much for all of your amazing questions. And now I shall request our panelists to give their concluding remarks in 30 seconds. So we shall go in reverse order. Uh, Catherine, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, that's easy. Um, well, I think uh, really, I think raise your voices, call out your leaders and the people around you to take action and take action yourself and really um, show empathy towards um, the problems of this world see how you can make it make a change and then do it i think this is um, my message in 30 seconds as the first one so thank you so much uh for that joseph the floor is yours no my only message is to say thank you i really appreciate this opportunity to be able to talk with all of you i learn a lot from these conversations and i cede the remainder of my time to the other four panelists thank you very much uh miss shannon thanks so much I, I think that my message is that we've had to all go through on a highly personal level the, the tragedy of COVID, um, whether that's experiencing being sick ourselves, uh, having loved ones that have been sick or died, um, all being locked down. And we need to use this tragedy as an opportunity that all of us have had to pause and rethink the world that we want and the systems that we need to have a better world to actually now implement that. We've known it inherently working in the UN, working in this space, but we've all now had to experience it on a visceral level. So I hope that it will be the impetus for really making the, the fundamental shifts and changes that we need to achieve the SDGs and, and have a better future. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Ms. Shannon, Mr. Nakatsha. Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to and encouraged actually to have participated to this webinar. I would like to invite those who are connected to, uh, to your foundation and to all those who uh, out there who feel like they need to be invited. I would like to really encourage them not to wait till they are invited, to take initial, take action, let, let their voice heard by whatever means they have at hand. This is so important and needed if we want to change our world. Thank you so much, Ms. Maria. Well, just to say thank you. Thank you again. And, and perhaps a call uh, on the need to, to fight indifference. And I think that we are all here. Um, we have convened under the, the Green Hope Foundation uh, because we are not indifferent, uh, active, committed, a uh, citizenship uh, is critical at this moment uh, in time. Uh, multilateral cooperation, solidarity, concerted action is what we need uh, to make this world uh, a better world and take this time of multiple crises as a time of creativity, uh, of reinvention and, uh, and of love for humankind and for nature. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maria. Ms. Campbell, the floor is yours. You're on mute. Thank in terms of reinvention, I think the one thing we should recognize is that intergenerational dialogue and conversation is crucial. Older people have to understand the capacity that young people have today. They're so much more connected. They're so much that they're able to do. 
and we can learn so much and generations change so quickly. Even the difference between older and younger children in the same family, the technology that they use, the things that they see, we must have them. At the same time, those of us who are older often have a different historical span of understanding. And I think many of us understand very deeply, I'm a baby boomer, my parents are both in uniform, World War II. The United Nations is a miracle. Many of these institutions that we've created multilaterally came out of crises and they're so precious and they're so important. So we can perhaps communicate the message of how vital it is for young people to use them, keep them functioning and recognize that, they, that they're that they not obvious that they are remarkable artifacts of a particular difficult time of human history. So if as gen intergenerational sharing of ideas, sharing of perspectives and supporting one another, I think those are the only ways that we are going to be able to tackle these kinds of problems is to respect and love one another and learn from one another and go for it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ms. Campbell. And thank you so much to all of our amazing panelists for your uh, insights today. And as we have uh, heard today, it will take more than just policies to drive change. It will require all sections of civil society, all stakeholders to contribute and collaborate to come out of this crisis. And we must never, ever allow the spotlight to shift from those who need the assistance the most. And the process of redevelopment must begin from those who are the farthest first or most affected by our world's problems and by COVID-19. And now it's incumbent upon developed nations to not just think within their own boundaries, but beyond, as our panelists said. And, you know, for instance, like how India is sharing its vaccines with other countries, even though it has over a billion citizens to inoculate. So that's really important. And symbolism will play a critical role in keeping the morale high. And of course, we must continue to monitor with full transparency the progress at all levels. And of course, we need intergenerational solidarity so that we are able to bring all voices to the table and together creating a sustainable world. So thank you so much for joining this dialogue today. And uh, we are confident that uh, you know your vision will provide the much needed answers to enable us to rebuild better. So please stay safe, stay connected, and take very good care of yourselves. We shall see you soon at our next webinar. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.